Welcome to the Sports Show, Mike Max, Patrick Royce, Brian Lawton, nice enough to join us, and the one and only Sid Hartman. Not happy. Sid is not happy because the Minnesota Wild lost again today, and you're growing ever concerned that they might not make the playoffs. Well, I can't remember when they got beat two games, ten by scores of six to one and four to one, ten to two. That's unbelievable. It's not good as you head down the stretch, right? Where do they stand during the playoff, Brian? Uh, if Columbus wins tonight and they were ahead two to nothing last I checked, they would be uh, tied with them for seventh, and then Detroit's got four games left, and they're in there too. So they're on the bar. They're, they they got to get four points, I'd say, don't you, Brian? A absolutely. They've got to win two of these last, last three, three games. Today was one of those must-win games, though. It really, mm -hmm. Everybody doesn't want to say it was, but this is a game when you looked at the schedule, Mike, you thought, geez, we got to put this one away. Calgary's out of it. They got Calgary six gave up players. Calgary a long time ago. Six yeah. rookies, eight, six nine rookies guys from, from Abbotsford. I mean, yeah. this we thought would be one that they would win. But with that said, hey, they're still going to make the playoffs. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you tell <laughs> you? A team I think they will, yes. You, you they're they're going to win two of the last three. When you were the GM of Tampa, you weren't afraid to go down in the locker room after a game if you didn't think the effort was good. What would you have said today? Based on everybody knew what was up. They had rest. They had everything, you know, it seemed like going in their direction, coming back. Yeah, no, it's true. I wouldn't be afraid to express myself. I think it's important in today's sports world that you communicate with the players more than ever. But at the same time, right now is not necessarily yeah. the time. Time to do that. It's a time to be positive. Everybody knows what happened. Kind of exactly. You, you got to keep it positive. They did shots today. So yeah. They, yeah, I, don't, they, they, I don't think we can blame effort. Exactly. They, they did some things well today, Mike. You don't want to panic. They'll win two of their last three games. So they play last, last they've three. got L.A. The Kings. Uh, and That's then they've tough. got Edmonton at home again. And then LA's Colorado. At home. And then they finish with Colorado on Saturday on the road, which is, you'd like to do it before that. That's for sure. <laughs> Although, uh, Colorado. Colorado's been a little better lately too, but they're they're, they're bad. And, Edmonton's, uh, Edmonton's terrible. So they the schedule schedule's still good, except the Kings favorable. are playing well. Yeah, yeah. The Kings will be the tough one. How uh, far will they go when they get in the playoff? What's what's your best worst matchup? Uh, the best matchup for me for the Minnesota Wild is the Vancouver Canucks. It's the three seed. The Wild would need to finish sixth in order to play the Vancouver Canucks. To me, that clearly is the best matchup for them. Anaheim, though, is uh, hitting a tough stretch here. They've lost, I think, four in a row, and they're going a little... They've been over their heads all year, and they're going a little flat. Just stay away from Chicago, right? Yeah, Chicago <laughs> is not a great matchup for the Wild. Anaheim, to me, is not a great individual matchup. Their okay. size has always given okay. the Wild problems, but they clearly have played better than anybody would have thought. But they never year. win in Vancouver. They won their first game in, in Vancouver in years. And, and you know what? That's the best chance the Wild have for a matchup because I don't like Chicago. I don't like Anaheim. I don't like L.A. Could be if they finish fifth and L.A. would be fourth. And I don't like San Jose. The Vancouver Canucks are the best the Wild can hope for. I was there, Sid, when they won Game 5 and Game 7 when they had no chance to win in that. I Vancouver was there, too, ten years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never right. know. we got to get West Wall to play. You play to three. Anybody can win. That's my theory. <laughs> Sidney, give us your summation of the season. Pardon me? What, what's your summary of the season so far? For the Wild? Yeah. I'd, I'd be disappointed. I mean, when they spend all that money to get all those players... And uh, then they made that deal for that guy with Buffalo that wasn't peanuts. And uh, they got pretty good talent. I would think the coach's job is uh, in jeopardy well, for, for the future. There, there is some irony here, Brian, tonight when you talk about them being tied with Columbus because Todd Richards took over what was sure. supposed to be a no-win situation in Columbus to ride it out. And he's right there with the Wild. Yeah, he's really done a remarkable job. And sometimes it just takes a while for guys to, even when you make it to the National Hockey League level, there's still some seasoning that needs to go on. Todd, he's done a great job in Columbus. He really has. Hey, Brian, is Sutter going to win the uh, Defense Month of the Year award, the it, it, Norris in, Trophy? In my opinion, he clearly should. Ryan Suter has had a fantastic year this year. He leads Sutter. the league in ice time. He played 30 minutes again today. Yep. He's got to be tired at this stage, but he just keeps putting he's out. He's a machine. He's playing 30 minutes a game. That tells you how good he is. Yeah, he's Pat, a machine. Pat, what do you think the fans expect? Do you think a first-round bounce to the playoffs is okay just because they've, they've it's been, been so long, long since they've even been in? I think that that's the minimum. I mean, they'll, they'll look, the Wild fans are the most, you know, they're easy to satisfy. So that if, they make, if they make it to the playoffs, they won't want 
they won't be burning down the building, but I think they expect more. They must have trouble selling tickets. They, they're on the front page of both St. Paul and Minneapolis papers. Well, they had 19,000 today. They didn't have too much. Well, uh, uh, they had a great sellout. Too. I don't believe those figures. Well, <laughs> so, <they're, laughs> so they haven't sold all their tickets, but they've decided to sell standing room in anyway. <laughs> Somebody's me. not getting a good deal. So, Brian, what's the difference between the Wild and the Wild being a number three seed? Is it one more defenseman? One more really good defenseman? Yeah, for me, th there's two issues I think the Minnesota Wild have to address. I don't think their, de their defense is deep enough right now. Suter and Brodine have been tremendous. After that, it's kind of been a hodgepodge. A lot of guys um, have done nice jobs for what they have, but they've got to upgrade their overall talent level there. And then the other issue I believe they need to correct is they need to get bigger on the wings all the way through the lineup. When you've got guys, Zach Parise is not a big man to start with. He plays like a big man, but he isn't big in stature. Jason Pominville, who they brought over from Buffalo, He's not big. is I also stood by him not a couple big. Times. Pierre Marc Bouchard is He's not a not big, big man. Michael Granlin, who they've got waiting and really doing a nice He's job as he develops, tough. he's not that big. And even Jason Zucker isn't that big. But, the, so but the smallest of all is this Jared Spurgeon, <laughs> who I <laughs> yeah. know people like, but I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't mistake him for a hockey player in 100 years walking down the street. No, you wouldn't. He, he's been a great story. He was a free agent signing of the Western Hockey League. He's, he's definitely surprised a lot of people with how well he's done. It's hockey IQ for him. And it's okay. You can have guys like that. That's fine. You just can't have, too you know, too many on the back end and definitely not too many on the wings. What about the lack of consistency, this team? They're up, they're down. You don't know what team is going to show up. Yeah, well, you know what? They started okay to the season. Then I really felt like they caught their groove, and then they've kind of hit the skids a little bit here towards this back third. So... You know, who knows? It's it's something they obviously want to address. What would you do when the Minneapolis Lakers were fighting for a playoff spot and they didn't play well? Would you go in after the game and have a word with them or not? Uh, we uh, fortunately, when I was run, when I was running, we didn't have that problem. Yeah, they were, <laughs> you were in there, eight and yeah? twelve. Take a break, yeah. come back, stay with us. <laughs> Hoyt's going over to a uh, Twins game this week there at home or wherever it is. Stop on by and see him. Patrick was just saying he was dining there the other night. What a great place. Say hi to Pat and the whole gang. Twins win four straight. Your take. How do you figure it out? L.A. Well, Anaheim they got uh, two of the highest priced guys in the history of baseball. And uh, they're not winning. And the White Sox aren't winning. They beat two teams that are not doing very good. But you got to give them credit. They went four in a row. Yeah. Patrick, the Angels Yankees. lost Grinky. They lost Herb Santana, who's pitching good for Kansas City. They lost They lost three of their pitchers. They they got the high priced, uh, they got the good high priced lineup, but they let their pitching go. Did down. you see a shot, a shot of Socha, though, and they walked Aaron Hicks twice in the same game? Mm -hmm. Trying to get him out, and they walked him, a guy hitting 040. The lad is, uh, the lad is struggling. He, uh, a big hit today. He got, well, yeah, kind of got out in front and a little shanked one to right field, but, uh, he's last, yesterday, he's got a chance to, uh, there's a lead runs at second base. He's ahead in the count, 3-1. Guy throws him a cookie, and he takes it. Uh, yeah, that tells me he's just up there begging for a walk, you know, yeah. instead of, you know, pull the trigger, son, hit it out of the ballpark. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, you know, the White Sox are, oof. That ain't the White Sox. No, they're, they're not bad. The relief they pitching don't have really drops off. They don't off. have any hitting either. Adam you know. Dunn is, Adam Dunn had a home run today. <laughs> he's hitting 100. He's uh, striking he was out. for 28 in yeah, the streak. he's striking out. White Sox. In that pitch that Jesse Crane threw to Josh Willingham, you could have hit up the yeah, middle. Yeah. White Sox budges like the Twins. Hey, look, look at the guys they let go. Is that some yeah. pretty good guys go? Pitching? They still got, fortunately for them, they still got the $54 million man, Adam Dunn. Who I think yeah. they gave him four years, $54 million. Brian, do you like, uh, you, you know, you worked under a salary cap, you're an agent pushing for money. Which one do you like? Baseball's the only one that really allows you to spend what you want. Yeah, it, it's, they have a luxury tax, so it's not completely an open market, but you can spend. I, I'm not crazy when you have this massive disparity that you see from the top teams to the bottom teams. I really think, ultimately, it, it makes for a significant competitive imbalance. When you have a team spending 30, 40, 50 million, and your top team spending 200 plus high 100s, that <laughs> creates a lot of mismatches. Now, the thing that's always surprised me, Mike, is that in hockey, I always thought that the bigger teams would want that. 
Right. And, they, and they really never have. In baseball, if I were the Yankees, I'd be very pleased with this system. I yep. pretty much can push my team, if I'm the Yankees, the Sox, whatever, I can push us to the front year in and year out. It raises the profile of baseball. It's good for our market, huh. and it's good overall for the game. But when I compare it, we just we don't have it in hockey. I don't think we'll ever see it. Basketball, Los Angeles Lakers next year, revenue sharing, $50 million. That they kick in. That's what Glenn Taylor told me. Yeah. Which means that they're making a lot of money. Well, baseball's headed, yes. when this next contract's up, they're headed for another dispute because they're going to have to uh, fight for a harder salary cap because these outfits like the Dodgers are figuring out how to hide, the, hide that revenue. You know, they got a $2 billion TV, regional TV yep. deal, and they're creating di a different company to try to hide it from from revenue sharing <laughs> and that's going to be a big legal fight. Sure it's, it will. And it's going to be a big legal fight to you know if you let if you let the Dodgers claim they're making 100 million on regional TV when they're making 500 million you're you got big problems. Yeah, yeah. It's remarkable what happened there how that team was operated for a number of years and then for them to sell out over a couple billion dollars. Yeah. You know, everything that preceded yeah, after, after they screwed yeah. everything up. It, it completely speaks to what television has done, certainly in regional in, TV in baseball. The, regional TV is now the lifeblood of baseball. Regional it, TV. It, it is. National. Yeah, it <laughs> creates its own networks, and that's yeah. what we haven't seen in the past. But talk well. about the Dodgers, the newest site for a football stadium in L.A. is... Uh, parking lot? Yeah. Parking lot at the Dodger Stadium? Yeah. That'll be quite a parking mess. They're going to have to tear down some homes in a bad section of town <laughs> if they want to park people. I, I think Mr. Anschutz, I mean, obviously, Tim Laiwicki getting let go recently. A lot of speculation having to do with not nailing the football team stadium downtown done. Uh, now, now, did Anschutz want the stadium? Or is that why he was banned at Laiwicki? Or it, what, it, what it, is it's the rumor? only rumor and conjecture. Tim Laiwicki is a tremendous executive, but ultimately... Uh, I believe that they wanted to get that done who downtown. Was that, who was around in Lewicki? Lewicki well, got let go. Uh, well, Lewicki you know got let go. With, huh? Did you know Lewicki got yeah, let go? I didn't know. Did Tim Lewicki? He got yes. let go. He got let go. So there, there goes your big well, source out know. there. When did that happen? AG. When was Lewicki it? Two ago. weeks ago? About three Lewicki. weeks ago. Yeah. And, and Tim is already rumored to potentially be the next to lead for the Toronto Maple Leafs. In what capacity? As the president. Okay, so, so not Sacramento the GM, obviously. No, of uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Tim is rumored to be, at least have a potential offer to go to Toronto. Was that new ownership group, huh? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, he's a very everybody. highly sought-after executive. Tim did a great job. And, How about the Timberwolves? They need a break. president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that when we come back. Come back to us. <laughs> there it is, Audi Minneapolis. Yeah, Stop on by. See Bruce Bonin and the whole group as we move into the spring. You may want to look at that A8 or that A4. I still like the Q7 because it's got all-wheel drive all the time. Great place to shop. Welcome back to the Sports Show. Mike Max, Patrick Royce, Brian Lawton, and Sid Hartman. Sidney, the Timberwolves, as they head into this offseason, maybe the most interesting offseason well, we've seen here's some what. time. You look at their situation, I think their future is tough. The Russian, free agent. Kirilenko. Petrovic, free agent. The guy they got from uh, Houston, free agent. Buttinger. You tell me, if they can't sign those three guys, what kind of position are they well, going to be in? Well, they can sign Pekovic. Huh? They can sign Pekovic. They can sign they, him? He's restricted, so they can equal. Boy, I got to tell you, though, watching they, him this year, I'm not so sure you're ever going to get more than 50 games out of him. Nah, he'll play 60. You got to play him. You got to sign him. What you else is out there, though? I, have, I don't know what else is out there. There's nothing out there. You got to sign him. Yeah, I'd be shocked he, if they don't bring him back. I, I think their future is... Yeah. They can meet anything? Yeah, meet yeah, any just offer, like yeah. Portland last year with that Batum. They can... Yeah, as they found out. <laughs> yeah. What, Brian? No, I, I think their future is bright. I mean, I really do. They're in a tough spot right now, but they'll, they'll get it done. They'll figure out a way. Their time is coming again. It's okay, so what would Timberwolves you do it, it, to when, do well When you're again. the GM and you've got this Edelman situation and you like it, what would you tell them? I mean, if this thing lingers on, let's say they don't get answers on the medical report, how would you handle that when you got a coach you want to bring back, but you just don't know? There's a lot of uncertainty. You know what? That's the $64 million question right now. I'm like, I, I can't really say I don't know enough about it to jump into it, but you do your due diligence, so then you make the best decision you can based off of that. The biggest problem is... Uh 
you know, not knowing if he's coming back and maybe wanting to hire a general manager at the same time. <laughs> then, uh, and, and what general... kind of influence do you give a guy, a coach, that you don't know if he's coming back or not? Yeah. That's... Well, it's some strange uh, what's happening with Khan. Uh, nothing has been announced. Taylor refuses to uh, say he's going to keep him. And I'm still betting that Flip's going to be the general manager of that team. What about Jerry Sloan if Adelman doesn't come back? Why have I heard that name more than once? Oh, Jerry Sloan? Sloan. Oh, is that right? Well, I know who's not coming back if it's Jerry Sloan. <laughs> Karolinko. <laughs> Goodbye, Karolinko. That'd be an easy one, yeah. yeah. Would you do it? I mean, if they like Adelman and the idea of an older coach, that's what Sloan is. I don't think he's going to come back. He, he quit coaching. His wife died of cancer. He's had all the Utah games. He's remarried, lives in Indiana. He might be, but... you ever seen a coach that didn't want to come back? <laughs> Besides Bud Grant? Well, I'll give you a little story about him. In Chicago, we drafted him number one, and he, his college out, outbid us. <laughs> oh, Sloan? Oh. Yeah. The next year, he was... He was drafted by the uh, Chicago. Where did he play college? Uh, well, I can't remember. New Chicago team. Where did he play college at, Sloan? Huh? Where did Sloan play college basketball? I can't remember. He was, yeah. a, was it Indiana State or? I don't He's know. an Indiana kid. Small yeah. school. I, uh, you know, when Chris Humphreys played for the Gophers, I wasn't real kind to him that year because he was the black hole of all mm -hmm. time, averaged 1.06 assists. So I, I figured I'd go down to Milwaukee. I was going to a Green Bay game and Utah was playing. Milwaukee on Saturday night, so I'd go down and make it up to him and write a nice of a, column. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Kind of. Oh, he's learning. That's the, how you do it. All these days. Did you tell me that when I was he's a player? Learning, he's learning the pro game, right? So I go and talk to Sloan. Sloan crucifies him. <laughs> Sloan. So now it looks like I deterred to Milwaukee just to rip just him rip again. <laughs> but you learned something here, Brian. Yeah, right, yeah. You learned something in. That's, that's why There's I come strategy and do this show because I learned something Sloan every was, time out. Sure. Sloan was probably the worst interview of uh, all coaches in oh, history. Oh, he was great. Huh? He was great. You might have caught him at the right uh, time, the was, right time. He was candid, let's put it that way. <laughs> How are you doing still with this Tubby Smith not being retained, though? Tubby Smith? Yeah, are you still down about that, or are you still upset? It's all over about Tubby Smith. This guy's yeah, come to... Yeah, but you took that really hard. I thought that that would have a lingering effect well, with you. I, now I sense that... What can I do about it? Yeah. It's over. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, this find guy's... out if the kid does the morning, Sunday morning radio <laughs> show or not. We'll find out. He'll what find out where it all stands. <laughs> Take a break. Hey, enjoying Bar Abilene on Thursday, May 2nd. They've got the DeMond Celebration, live country music from Nashville recording artist Brandon Allen, taco eating contest, salsa dancing, Sydney's lighting up, and drink specials including $4. Do they have weekend. guacamole. Oh, yeah, there's always guac there. Always guac available. Big week for you, NFL Draft Week. What do you think? Well, whatever. They, they can't go wrong on this draft. Everybody you talk to say that there's more good players in this draft than it has been for 20 years. You got all these guys coming out, uh, real good players, and uh, they can't go wrong. But uh, they've hurt themselves a little bit. That Winfield thing, I still can't understand that thing. I mean, their secondary was no big bargain. He was their best player. And uh, we'll see how the Harvin trade works out how Jennings works out, mm -hmm. all these new things they did. Well, uh, hey, they're going to get Manti Teo because they always get the story. Whatever the story is, <laughs> the Vikings end up with it. You know, The only it's reason true. I, he's, he's going to be in Mankato. There's no doubt about it. He'll be, they'll get him, and then they'll probably get a wide receiver to go with him, I would think. I was with Tony Dungy yesterday, Brian, and a GM, he said, this is what you do when you scout. I was asking, how do you scout players sure. for drafts? And he says, there's always one person I wanted to talk to if we're going to draft, and that was the equipment manager from the college you played sure. for. True? Absolutely. These are the guys that really know the life behind what we see necessarily out on the field. We can weed out on the rank, whatever you want to say. The trainers know everything that goes on. And it's a great resource. Yep, they Too can bad tell they you. didn't talk to the equipment manager when they drafted Demetrius Underwood, huh? Don't remember that? <laughs> well, that was that, remember that was that defensive line coach, I forget his name, that got all high, thought he had found the, uh, yeah. the and diamond then the, in the I wonder. And the guys at Michigan State, Saban was there, said don't touch him with a 100 foot pole, but they took him anyway. The reason the trainers know more now, they used to know a lot, 
But they don't know more. They, every player that comes in, they examine years ago. They never did all these examinations and all these different things to do right now. But the money's big that you're investing. I was looking through the late 90s and the early 2000s, and except for Landon, Randy Moss, and so they had some of the worst drafts of all time. And then last year they came back strong. We'll see. See you back here next week, everybody.